Anxiety is a scary thing. I never experienced it before until I've been, it's, it's, it's like, anxiety is to me, I can define it as the unknown because you're, you're unsure of what the next day might be. You are unsure of how your body's gonna react to the weather. I mean, I get now, I'm, I feel like I'm an old man, I'm 39, when the weather changes, my bones and stuff ache. Never had that problem before now until I got an accident. So it, anxiety to me is the unknown. That's why you, it, it's anxiety because you don't know exactly how you're gonna react to a situation. I think just not being able to, um, I have anxiety with not being able to know the next step sometimes. Probably a year after my accident, I was gonna have to have an MRI done. And for some reason I got next to the table and I was about to have to transfer to it to do the MRI and something hit me. And it's just, it, what I, I had never dealt with anxiety. So for me, it was like, what is this? What's going on? And of course I ended up, I was having an anxiety attack just Still don't know why. It was just something about getting that MRI done that day that my mind and body was telling me it's not happening. And so from that point on, I realized that that was one of those things that I was going to have to deal with. That was kind of like depression. I didn't, I never saw anxiety as, to me, it was like, okay, get over it. Just get over it. But when it hit, and I finally had to really face it. It was like, okay, this is a very real, very real situation. I think anxiety and fear are very common in situations with uh, traumatic injury because, again, we're talking about the unknown. Um, if, if I can share an example, if, if we think about when we go from elementary school to whatever it's called now, middle school, uh, there's some fear and anxiety around that because that's something new. And when we go from middle school to high school, again, there's some fear and anxiety because it's, it's changed. And then even more so when we go from high school to college. But the common theme in that is school. We at least have something that we look back on that we knew we did it. I did this in elementary school. I did this in middle school. I did this in high school. With something like a traumatic injury, we don't have anything quite that significant to look back on and see, how did I do this before? Uh, most people do not have more than one injury that's significant like this. So, so you're really punting. And it's really hard for people to punt because something that's so impactful in their life. So I think anxiety is common. I think fear is common. I think where you have to be careful is is letting that sort of snowball into, oh my gosh, so this happened to me. So now what's gonna happen is I'm gonna have to depend on people. And so if I have to depend on people, what if somebody can't be there? And then if somebody can't be there, oh my gosh, I don't have a way to support myself. And if I don't have a way to support myself, oh my gosh, I'm gonna end up out on the street. And if I end up on the street, oh my gosh, what's gonna happen? And then it builds and it builds and it builds. I think a lot of my anxiety is fueled by not wanting to be embarrassed. A lot of um, self-confidence issues, right? Uh, if I want to transfer onto a couch at a friend's house and I have an accident, right? That's embarrassing because now I've got to clean it up and, you know, who knows if somebody else has to help me, right? I, and for a you know for a 24 25 year old guy that was 63 that never had any problems doing anything for himself i have a really big problem with needing help from others and i think that's that's what fuels a lot of my anxiety is not knowing the what if of am i going to be able to get into this place or this this friend of mine's house right and all the obstacles that come with it that causes a lot of anxiety I remember one time, I was with my parents, I'll give you a story, and we went to a, we were doing a Western thing for the, my mom is a community activist, so she does a lot of things out in the community, and we was doing a cowboy theme. So we went to a cowboy store, and went in there and got hats and boots. And when I got in there, I was starting to get a, a, you know, a spasm. When I get up too fast, my spasm um, activate. And I felt myself, I was trying to walk like I was, it's, it's funny to me, I know I'm not gonna be normal, no, but I was trying to walk like I was normal. And my spasm caught up me. 
And I felt my body stiffening up and I felt myself panicking. The anxiety came on. I mean, my heart started beating fast. I started sweating. I just started to get scared and wanted to like find a, a comfort zone, somewhere I could just go and try to meditate or get out the public eye so nobody wouldn't see my frailties. One question I get from patients is, what are some things I might get anxious about after this injury? And I think that is a very open-ended question. I think the main theme is the unknown. This is a new path you have never taken, right, in terms of whether it's your physical body or how to proceed with different roles that you have in your life. So I think that's sort of the overarching theme. However, when, when it goes to the nitty gritty, I think some patients I hear a lot about is bowel bladder in terms of, I think, confidence and also embarrassment, humiliation, and also loss of dignity that comes with bowel bladder. And I think there's a lot of anxiety with how do I manage this? How do I not bring a lot of attention to myself? And if I did have a bowel bladder accident, will people look at me differently? So I think with the bowel bladder in terms of having accidents, what out in the community, I think if it's with friends, if you feel comfortable, you might want to give them a heads up like, hey, I have a small cord injury. How I used to poop and pee is not the same anymore. And this is the way I kind of do my bowel bladder program. And there is a chance that something might happen. So I wanted to give you a heads up. So there is no sort of like elephant in the room if it did happen. Number two, I think problem solve and prepare ahead of time, right? So bring a change of clothing. Know maybe the ins and out of someone's house, like how to do a transfer, or where is the closest bathroom, so you can immediately address that issue. A lot of times people are afraid of, how am I gonna support myself? If I was the major breadwinner of my family or if I'm just the person that supports myself, what if I can't get a job again? What if people don't like me because of my injury? What if I get rejected by my family because I'm not in the same role? You know, these are pretty common fears that people have. What if nobody falls in love with me is a big common one. What if I don't find somebody again? What if I can't have children? What if I'm a burden for the rest of my life? I'm afraid of that. So I think you can look at a lot of these fears as not fears that you just have yourself, but fears that everybody has with something like this. Where it becomes more worrisome is how is that affecting your day-to-day -day life and is it preventing you from moving through your life? So if we relate it again to, I'm so anxious that I'm not even getting out anymore because I'm afraid to leave my home, because I'm afraid of what people are gonna say about me, or I'm afraid I might have an accident while I'm outside a bowel or a bladder accident. And it starts to become limiting in our life where we are not actually functioning. We're not either getting up or we're not getting out or we're not doing activities that we would normally do. That becomes a point where we need to do something about it. If it's just uh, a fear of, oh my gosh, I just don't know how this is gonna look and we sit in that for a little bit and we kind of stew in it, but then we find other things to do to take our mind off of it, I think that's pretty normal it's gonna rear its ugly head periodically. It's how long do I stay in that? What, what I wanna make sure is that you're not staying in that for an indefinite period of time and you're spinning in it. Oh man, that's scary. Uh, you're unsure again, anxiety, it's a panic attack, meaning you just, you're real frizzled. You're everywhere, you're scattered. I mean, you can't, have your train of thoughts are up and down. I mean, your 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 breath, your breathing is erratic. Um, my body would have I would have a spasm. Um, it just it can be a scary time. Yeah, I've gotten shaky. Um, I haven't gotten to the point of be hyperventilating, not being able to control my breathing. But I definitely do get shaky and to the point where I just kind of want to curl up and you know into a fetal position and not do anything? I never had a full out panic attack, but I definitely had some some instances where I think I worked myself up um, 
you know, I, I scared myself really bad. Another thing is that feeling of helplessness when you're alone sometimes. So I can think of a time when they left me on my back. And at that point, I couldn't turn. Uh, and that feeling of being stuck in one position uh, and nobody around. I, and my voice wasn't very strong for a while. So, you know, feeling like you can't call for help uh, and just praying that someone will think to come and get you. Uh, it's So I went through, it, it, it just feels, it's just, it's an overwhelming kind of fear physically, the feeling of, it's, it's just, It's like, a, it's like a weight. Some common symptoms of a panic attack are people will say, I feel like my heart is racing and I can't seem to slow it down. Some people will say, I feel like I'm sweating. And it's different than a workout sweating. It's just sort of this all over, I'm just hot, I'm flushed. Uh, again, I can't seem to sit still. Uh, I feel like when I think about something, my, my mind is racing everywhere else. Um, the other common symptoms are, um, I feel like if I go out somewhere, um, I'm going to have more of this kind of feeling. And so I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm needing to be sort of, you know, enclosed. Uh, some people will also say I'm having a hard time breathing. I feel like I can't catch my breath. I feel like I'm shallow breathing. Um, I feel like I'm just racing in my head. I can't quiet anything down. So it's like your body's on overdrive, your mind is on overdrive. People will say, my mouth is getting really dry. I feel like I don't have enough saliva. I can't swallow. And so it builds like that. If you are experiencing anxiety or panic attacks, here are some things that you can do to help. First one is if you're able to breathe on your own, you want to start doing some deep breathing in through your nose, out through your mouth. And what you can do is count a little bit, in for four, out for four. Or you may breathe out for twice as long. Um, if you can do this several times, it will help slow down your breathing rate, your heart rate, and your blood pressure. Along with this, as you become more calm, you may try closing your eyes and getting centered by doing some meditation. Uh, I will caution you though, if you are in full-fledged panic mode, it's hard to meditate because it's hard to quiet your thoughts. If this is something that's right before a full-fledged pa panic mode, meditation often works. You can find something to focus on and concentrate on that. And then while you're concentrating, you want to describe in detail uh, everything that you are sensing and feeling because it can help be a distractor from the panic. If you're able to move muscles, you can try some muscle relaxation techniques, um, in which case you would squeeze a certain muscle, hold it for a count of three or four seconds, and then release. And then you would move on to another group of muscles that you can move. Again, the same thing. Squeeze those muscles, hold it for a count of three or four, and then release. Um, because what you may find that you've been tense, and as you relax, you may find that your anxiety and panic also relaxes. Oftentimes, panic will escalate when there's a lot of stimuli around, so you can reduce the extra stimuli by closing your eyes. Um, it may be easier that way to work on your deep breathing. Another thing that you might want to do is turn down any noise uh, that might be going to a quiet room or turn off the TV. Um, sometimes that helps to allow yourself to center more. And that leads into being able to practice some mindfulness, which can help ground you and make you feel more centered. A lot of times people will say when they're feeling anxious or they're uh, in panic mode, they feel like they're not really in reality. There's a kind of separation. When you can focus, which is what mindfulness is, on what you can feel and what you can hear, it's easier to stay into the reality of now. That kind of is very similar to guided meditation or relaxation. And there are many apps now that you can get on your computers and phone. And they will actually talk you through a meditative process or talk you through something that is mindfulness where you're not having to do that on your own, particularly if it's hard for you to do that. You can also picture yourself in a place that makes you happy. And again, describe that place in detail. So whether it's a place, a thing, a feeling, you're, you're trying to get very specific so that takes away from your anxiety. I may focus on a favorite place of mine which may be up in the mountains. 
And what I might do in mindfulness is picture that in my head and describe in detail what do the leaves look like on the tree? What does the air feel like? Am I cold? Am I warm? And really get as focused as I can. If you are able to move and you can participate in exercise, exercise is a great thing to do because it increases the endorphins, which actually brings our mood up. And so doing something light, for example, if you're able to lightly lift weights, even if you're in a power chair, it may be that you actually take your chair out and you go for a drive in your neighborhood. You're doing something where you're out and about in the outdoors, which is also very helpful. Um, I will caution you, though, that if you are having trouble breathing or if you're getting to where you're feeling shortness of breath, you'll need to calm down first and catch your breath before you would go participate in exercise. There are some scents which are naturally calming, such as lavender oil. That's a big one. And you can either put some directly on your wrist and practice deep breathing while you're taking in that scent. They make teas that are lavender or chamomile-based teas, which are also relaxing, and sometimes that just helps calm you. Not only is it just the flavor of the tea, but it's warm, and it kind of brings you down. You may feel like you just need to talk it out, and I'm not necessarily saying call your counselor if you have one, but it may be that you talk with a family member or a friend um, and just kind of talk out what it is you're feeling. And sometimes what they can do is help you kind of move through that and offer you some insight and, and help you stay more grounded in the reality of right now. If you've been prescribed medication for anxiety and you cannot calm yourself down, you may need to take one of your prescribed medications, but only take as prescribed. This is not a free-for-all where you would actually take extra. Uh, I encourage you to follow exactly what your physician said in terms of the medications. Um, some anxiety medications are prescribed on an as-needed basis. And if you're in full-fledged panic mode, it may be one of those times that you need to take it as needed. So anxiety has a lot of overlap with heart attack or panic attack, such as heart, racing heart, tightening in the chest, um, elevated blood pressure. And so patients often say, like, when do I seek immediate attention? If it doesn't resolve immediately or within a few minutes, I would say go to the nearest medical emergency room or have your, if you're with someone else, evaluate if there's any sort of autonomic dysreflexic. Um, that could be happening. Oftentimes, autonomic dysreflexia has also overlap with anxiety. So before even doing going to the medical emergency room, you might want to have someone else or yourself check out if it's something, a dysreflexic event. I remember in the beginning, um, I used to have a lot of, like, I'll, I remember when I was first in Shepherd. I'll give you an example. I didn't sleep for like five months. I was just... Every time I closed my eyes, I felt like I was gonna die. I was, I had bags, I couldn't eat. I mean, it was terrible, I didn't want to sleep. Felt like every time I closed my eyes, the accident would come, I would see myself go head first to the glass. Now, it did take me until, I would say very recently, that I don't have to have the TV on all night anymore. Uh, I went through a lot of different ways of trying to calm myself at night to go to sleep, uh, but, I'm, I'm finally at a point now where I can sleep in a dark room and not be uh, anxious. Um, you know, I, I tried meditation, I did audio books and leaving the TV on. And so it just took time for me to figure out how I could relax enough to go to sleep. I think particularly when we're talking about traumatic things that have happened to somebody, um, a lot of times people will say, I have flashbacks to my accident or I am in my bed and I'm sleeping and I'm calm and then it's been quiet and all of a sudden I'm right back where I was before. And it sort of recreates this thing over and over again. People will call it a flashback or people will call feel like I'm having post-traumatic stress. I'm, I'm just in this all over again. And so it's a common theme for people to have. It doesn't mean that it's something that stays with you forever. A lot of people also say, I'm on high alert, like I feel hypervigilant about everything. And this is sometimes seen with people who have maybe been shot and they didn't see it coming or had a um, 
Like, say, for example, a car accident that was very sudden, came out of nowhere, didn't see it coming. Um, and so they're on high alert because they're trying to be sort of protective of, oh, gosh, what if this happens again? And I have to be mindful of everything. A common thing that I have heard over the years are loud noises really are frightening to people. Um, and it feels like people will say, I feel like I have this electrical shock that's happening through my body, and it takes me back to the accident again. When we're talking about panic or PTSD or flashbacks, you know, coming into our life, uh, it's a pretty common thing that people have after a traumatic injury. Um, and so there are some resources, you know, if this is something that periodically occurs, you might want to contact your community um, uh, mental health center. Uh, you might want to look at the resources that we have on, on our website here to help with you know, how do other people move through something like this? When we're talking about something that's occurring on a regular basis, on a daily basis, that is really impeding in our ability to move forward in our life, um, if we're talking about something that's causing us so much fear and anxiety that we're having thoughts of harming ourselves, then we want to look at calling 911. We want, we want to get to this uh, solution as soon as possible because if we don't, then that creates further problems down the road. We have the ability also that if this is something that's occurring on a regular basis, but we're not feeling harmful to ourselves, what you may want to do then is call your primary care physician and say, hey, this is what's going on in my life. Is there something that you can do to help me? Is there maybe a medication I can take that actually calms some of this anxiety and this panic and these feelings of post-traumatic stress? And so we're trying to look at sort of the order of when do I call and who do I call? For additional resources, please visit our website.